So welcome everybody. Got a few more people kind of punching on. Um, this should be pretty quick, uh, easy, um, relatively simplistic, uh, not too complicated stuff. And um, I hope, you know, I mean, you guys keep coming week after week and I post the um, videos on YouTube and I can see how many people have looked at them and there are people looking at them. So I'm really glad that you're finding this useful information. I'm trying to think of stuff that you're going to run into throughout the year that is not ever really talked about. Um, I do see those questions that come up on on the different Facebook groups that I'm on, and you know I throw stuff in there. But I figure if you're asking it or somebody else is asking it, uh, you know it's a good thing to talk about. <clears throat> and one that has come up a few times is the, the refunds of premium payments. How does that work? So I'm going to talk about the, the just premium payments in general. And then the other thing that I know nobody's ever asked, but I've run into that is at the end of the year, somebody's behind on their payments, it's open enrollment, kind of how that works. And want to make sure everybody understands completely how premium payments work on the marketplace uh, with tax credits and without tax credits. So this is all kind of combined together with the premium payments. So what, if you don't know this, when somebody, in, when you um, fill out the application, yeah. excuse me, and you hit submit and you're on Health Sherpa, you can in instantly make that first payment. Um, I have not done a payment through insurer yet, but on Health Sherpa, so you can make that first month's payment for them. As soon as you hit the payment button and it goes to the portal of the, the carrier, always keep a copy of the confirmation. Um, I do a screenshot and I attach it, I download it, um, I print it, I give it to them. Like. Make sure you've got a copy of it um, so that the carrier can't say, oh, it wasn't us or we didn't do it. It is their portal. This is not Health Sherpa's portal. It's not healthcare.gov's portal. It's the it's the carrier's portal. It's the link that they gave for premium payments. So copy that receipt. Then it takes anywhere from three to four to five, six days, sometimes a week, especially during open enrollment, for the premium payment that you just did to actually get into the system of the insurance company. Then the insurance company verifies it, clears it, the check clears or whatever, they get the money. Then they tell healthcare.gov, we have gotten payment. Then that's when it will stop saying, pay your premium payment. Um, it's the button goes away, um, it's now effectuated. There is a grace period. Um, every company is a little different, but you basically have a month. That, that's pretty common. You have, you, if you need it for the first of the month, you have that whole month to make that payment. If they don't make the payment, it's just going to cancel. Nobody's going to call them and go, hey, by the way, you didn't make a payment. But you have a, about a month. I don't tell clients this. Don't tell them that. People tend to put things off, <laughs> right? Um, if you are signing somebody up in uh, November 1st for January 1st, you don't have to make that first month payment. You don't have to, if somebody's like, I really don't have the money right now. Okay, that, that's two months in advance, that's fine. But if you're signing somebody up on the 25th and they need it for the first, don't give them the option of paying it any other way except, all right, let's make that first month's payment. Just say it, don't, you don't have to say, would you like to just go, okay, let's make the first month's payment. And if they're like, well, I don't like doing it online or whatever, you go, nope, this is just to get you in. After this, if you wanna send checks, that's up to you. If you wanna set a, a through your bank, the, the bill pay through your bank. That's fine. But just say, would you like to make that first month's payment? Because there isn't, every carrier is a little different. And there are some that will be like, hey, we're going to get it in a week. And you're just, you, they don't have insurance. And I have to start all over and it's a big pain. So save yourself the headache and your client. Do the application and say, all right, let's make that first month's payment. Once they've made the payment, if they are getting a tax credit, once they've made that first one, so now it's, it's effectuated, there is a three month grace period. Now, again, I don't tell my clients they have three months to make their next month's payment because then they're always behind. It does happen, but there is a three month before the insurance company can cancel them. There is a ruling that not too many carriers do, but we had a carrier who researched it, figured it out. It does say, and I unfortunately I don't have that, that part of the Affordable Care Act document to show you, but it's hundreds of pages and I don't remember where it's at. But they 
if the carrier goes three months, sends out the notices on that third month, if they terminate them and they back terminate it, they can still charge one of those three months. Many carriers do not. They just, all right, you, you haven't paid since March. We're just going to cancel you as of February 28th. And they don't charge for that month, but they are allowed to. So there is a three month grace period. It is kind of handy when somebody is not paying attention. Maybe they had auto pay set up on their credit card and their credit card expired and they didn't pay attention. <laughs> and it's now two months past and they finally open their bill and it says that they owe three months worth because they owe the two previous ones and then the next one coming. And they call me and they're in a panic or whatever. There is a three month grace period. So um, at a, it's kind of a long time. That becomes a problem during open enrollment. So imagine it's October right now and you're signing somebody up and they want to stay with the same carrier. They're going to have to pay the three months. They can't float it. They can't go, eh, you know, whatever. I, I don't need it um, October, November, December, those three months. I just need it in January. They cannot stay with the same carrier then. They have to, they have to pay October, November, December and January's. If they don't, the insurance is going to cancel them all the way back to October. So they can't just restart it in January. But let's say they're in Anthem Blue Cross this year and it's October and they are three months behind in January. They're going to a different carrier. They're going to Oscar. They're going to United Healthcare. They, what will happen is they'll pay the new carrier for January. The old carrier will backdate and they just are done. They don't have to pay Oscar from 2023 to get United Healthcare for 2024. The insurance carriers aren't talking. The government doesn't tell them, hey, by the way, this person doesn't pay their bills. So it, it's just, I want you to understand how that works. It's really odd. I know it's kind of a strange thing that they have a three month grace period, but if they are going to stay with the same carrier, they have to. Um, they, they can, have I to can I ask you yeah. a question on that? Sure. Uh, what happens if there are um, claims filed in that 90 days? That's when, if they do do claims, then the insurance carrier can absolutely get it. But I don't know if you know this, um, if somebody's behind on their payment, at least in my state, every carrier does this. If they're behind, their prescriptions are immediately turned off. So while they technically have insurance for those three months, they won't be able to get prescriptions. And that's because of that reason. So, you know, um, it's hard to go back and get claims. So they may have submitted claims, but if they're behind on their bills, a lot of times the insurance carriers are holding it. You know, um, if they did pay, they will send all that money. They will ask the hospital, the doctors, give me that money back. And now the hospital and doctor is going to go after them. So um, if somebody's behind, I, I have you gone to the doctor? Have you used this at all? Well, yes. Well, then you need to make this payment or you're going to end up owing the hospital and the doctor a whole lot more money, right? Because then it won't be the contracted rate. It's going to be the hospitals are going to charge whatever they want. So Jill, you said confused. If they're already on auto pay and we sign them up with the same carrier, they have to pay October, January, February. That's if they've missed it. So I'm not, Jill, it's not if they've been paying. Yes, I'm talking about somebody comes into you for open enrollment and they have not paid. They're not set up for auto pay. They're just, and they're behind on their payments. Um, if their plan expired for non-payment earlier in the year, um, does the member have to pay one month before? Nope. If it has expired, they've stopped paying and their, their insurance was technically done in August and they want the same carrier for January, they can't. The insurance, the carrier is not going to say, sorry, you didn't pay us back then. So they don't have to pay any of that. They start fresh at January. And I've had that too. Um, and sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes I find out, um, uh, actually, sometimes what happens is somebody didn't know that they had a three month grace period because it, you know, nothing has a three month grace period, right? You can't let your electricity go for three months. <laughs> you will lose your lights. Your trash will not be picked up. And so I think some people are like, oh, I'm behind. And then they just stop paying. And all of a sudden they get that three month window and they're like, oh, well now it's a lot and I can't afford it because I lost my job. And then I go, oh, you need to tell me that. I could have lowered your premium. If you lose your job, if something happens, and hey, let me know because I can go in in the middle of the year and we can lower it. So it's if somebody, if you're in that situation where somebody has not paid, they're behind, 
you can ask them, say, you know, no judgment. I'm just asking, has there been a life change? Has something happened? And then they tell you, yeah, I lost my job and I don't have any income right now. Well, heck, I can go in there. Let me lower your premium payment. You know, hey, we'll free for a couple months work for you, you know, until you get a job. Because the whole point is that people should have insurance when they need it. And we can go in and adjust it. And I think that's the other thing. People don't realize, even people I tell, they don't realize we can adjust their insurance premium payment because of their income changing any time in the year, especially if they lose income, right? Well, they don't want to struggle paying three months. So they don't, um, so in, in that bit of that thread, if somebody is supposed to submit documentation, particularly income documentation, um, I've talked about that in previous ones and I have a a uh, very nice uh, letter of explanation. And actually healthcare.gov just came out with one. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in a little, in a later one that was basically what I've been submitting. They just put it in a nice form, but let's just say they, they're supposed to submit their financials. They don't, or they do, and it's the wrong kind. And the tax credit disappears. This came up recently, somebody asked about it. So the person suddenly finds out for July, they owe the entire amount. They owe 800 bucks and they are typically paying 300. If they can tell you about it beforehand, they call you on June 25th, they just opened their premium payment and they're like, oh my goodness, I have an $800. You know, why is it 800? I'm only supposed to be paying 200. I don't have 800. You can fix it. Immediately go in, update the application and it will give them that tax credit again. And it's going to give them the three month grace period to submit documentation. So you can go in immediately. Like just if they tell you before July 1st that their July premium is going to jump. If they tell you after July 1st, you can't really backdate it. You can go forward. You can say, all right, I can fix it. As of August, it's going to be 300 bucks again or 200 what it's supposed to be. Is it possible for you to pay that month of July, the full premium payment? You're going to get it back at tax time. Because when they file their taxes, their income is going to be what was put on there, right? They, they don't owe the whole amount. So they would get it back. If they absolutely positively cannot then that's when you could switch them to a different carrier because they technically just lost coverage. Um, you would move them for August 1st to a new carrier um, saying they've lost coverage at the end of July because, or actually technically June, because they're not going to pay the 800. They don't have it. I mean, if somebody's on the CSR, they don't have $800 to pay. They did technically lose it. You're just kind of doing it ahead of time to get them over to a different carrier. They could go back in January to the new one um, and they don't have to pay that 800. There is also another trick. Um, I haven't had to do it for a while, so I, I can't 100% say that this works, but it has the last few times I've tried it. The person has to create a healthcare.gov account. They got to go there, make a username, password at healthcare.gov. They find their application. There's a spot, they don't fill out the application. They have to enter their name and their date of birth and who they are. And then the government verifies, is this who you are? They ask them some verification questions. Then there's a spot that says, find my application. So you find that, it brings up the application. Um, and if they do the application at healthcare.gov twice, they update it and then update it again, it will change the premium payment for that day. It's a glitch in the system and I have used it. So now they don't owe 800. Let's say they call you on July 3rd or July 7th. Now they're only gonna owe a prorated amount of 800, which is really strange. So um, I'll just 800 divided by 30 days. It's $26 a day times seven days. So they're really gonna have to pay 186 bucks. It's a really strange glitch that I, um, I found only back in the day when we all had to use healthcare.gov in order to do this. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but if somebody really needs their insurance, they can. <laughs> oh, Jill, I push a lot of buttons. Uh, that's how I found that glitch. But yes, you can go in there and it will affect it that day. So then, okay, can you come up with 135 bucks? You know, And it's weird. And I'm sure the insurance com companies are like, oh my goodness, what the heck? Because it changes it mid day. <laughs> but it's a, it, it's, it, it's not a smart system. Um, it's part of that whole don't go, don't call healthcare.gov and do not go on healthcare.gov to cancel somebody who's turning 65 until the last day of the month. It's that same glitch that it happens at the exact time time. 
can just get it to do it, but it takes twice. You have to do the application twice. Um, if you remember nothing else and this suddenly comes up, shoot me a, a message and I will walk you through it. I walk you and your client through it to get that done. Um, I think it's important to see if they can do it. Can they pay that one month? Maybe they, you know, maybe they have the money. They're going to get it back at tax time. But if they cannot do it, this is kind of a way around it, is creating that healthcare.gov account. Let me see if I miss any questions over there. Uh, did you change? What do you change twice? Is it the income? You can you can change the income. It's just you hit update the application. Um, you can update that application as many times as you want. I I think my record is twenty times in a day trying to get it to do what it was supposed to do. So we just told the client, "Hey, you're going to get a ton of emails. Just ignore them. You know, healthcare.gov. Really make it make it go to your spam." Um, it was a weird glitch with the kid, and yes, and it took about twenty times to get it to do it. So you can update it. Just say update application and change nothing. It'll still let you keep doing that. Um, I know there is the theory of changing the income by a dollar or two. You can do that too, because a dollar, two bucks isn't going to change the outcome, but it does make the system go, hey, there was an official change. You can do that as well. So, you know, add a buck, change a buck. Um, yeah. I've had to do drastic changes to income to get it to do it to work. Person made fifty thousand, and the system was not doing what it was supposed to. So I changed it to twenty thousand, and then it did what it was supposed to do. And then I redid the application and moved it back to fifty thousand. So the whatever the last application you do, the most recent one overrides the other ones. It literally makes the other one disappear. It's kind of a dumb system in a way, but it's also good. If you actually went back to healthcare.gov, they would go, nope, we don't see it. We don't see that one you just did 10 minutes ago because you've done another one in three minutes. Unless they create a new application, which you don't want to do. They, you want to just keep the same one. And updating the app, do I enroll in the plan? So yes, Catherine, absolutely. When you are doing any application, walk it all the way through. You updated the application. Now make sure you go in there and select the right plan. I have a personal habit. I do it for various reasons and now um, in the past, and I just now do it all the time. Every time I am updating the application, every single time, doesn't matter why I'm updating it, I say they're losing coverage at the end of the month because that makes whatever changes I just did go in effect for the first of the following month. Um, I will terminate somebody going on Medicare in the middle of, you know, a, a couple, the one person's staying on it, one person's going on Medicare. I'll go in on the 15th of the month, update the application, say, you know, Bob is no longer taking it, but Susie is losing her insurance at the end of the month. And then it changes it. Everybody stays on Medicare the way they're supposed to until the end of the month. Um, so that is my habit. I always say that when you do that, it always lets you um, reapply that information to picking the new plan. So walk it all the way through, go all the way through to this is the plan I want and hits the bit. The pay button disappears. Um, you don't have, you don't get a pay your premium button for a current existing application with the same carrier. You will get a pay your premium button when you switch carriers, when um, the main spouse, the person who was listed first with the one going on Medicare and you're taking them off. Now the spouse who was secondary is now becoming primary. Now they're getting a whole new application. They're getting a whole new premium notice, new member number, then that premium button pay premium will show up. Um, and that's another reason I tell clients the system is not smart. As you can see, there is no way to pay. Just ignore it, keep paying the way you have been. Um, so ignore those emails that say pay my premium because you've already paid it. Keep paying it the way you have. Um, it's not a smart system, there, which eventually it's going to be smart. And then we won't be able to do some of the things that we're doing for clients. But hopefully the system will be smarter. It'll be working for clients. Again, this is federal exchange, not the state exchanges. They're their own entity. I can't speak to them. Um, uh, I have thought if I can find a specialist for each state that does a state exchange, um, I would uh, have separate Zooms. Like if anybody wants to learn California, I got a California person. If anyone wants to learn Penny, you know, but uh, I have to find all those experts first, but that's kind of in the future. 
So Sharon, can I repeat again how to deal with a person aging into Medicare with a spouse? So yes, assuming again, there's two people or more on the plan and one of them is going on Medicare. Update the application. You can do it any time in the, the month bef before they come off. So if it was July and you need them to come off in August, any time in July, um, go in there, say, update the application, unclick whoever it is that needs the Medicare coverage, and then say that the spouse, the person who is staying on the plan, is going to lose their coverage at the end of the month. So I would say July 31st or July 30th. It doesn't have to be exact, but you know, July 30th. The system will then say as of August 1st, Medicare spouse is on, off in the feet, and the other spouse is on. It doesn't change it that day. If you are in the habit of calling healthcare.gov to do that, you have to wait until the last day of the month. You cannot call them in the 15th of the month and have it happen because they will lose their Medicare or their coverage on the 15th. It's a stupidity of the system. Um, it won't go to the end of the month. So you, the only way I know how to do it so that you don't have to wait to the last day of the month, because I did that for years and years. I was always on my computer on the 31st and 30th of the month doing that for people is through Health Sherpa, state that the spouse, the one who is staying on the insurance is losing their coverage at the end of the month. Yes, so Kathy, you just asked, um, should the spouse closer to the Medicare age be entered as a dependent? I, in, unless they are in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, I always list the oldest person second or whoever's going on Medicare. So if somebody's uh, disabled, list whoever is going to hit Medicare first as secondary. And I, I haven't had pushback um, a couple times, you know, like maybe like, especially if you're talking to 60 year olds, they're used to the, the husband always being listed first. I just say, all right, I'm going to list the youngest person first, because when it comes to Medicare, it'll make your life easier if they're listed first. And everybody goes, okay. So I haven't had too much pushback. The only time is when there's some kind of weird personal situation where Susie hates getting all the mail and his name she wants it. She wants it to be him. You know, okay, I can, but the year that the he is going to be turning sixty-five, I swap it, um, or you put them in separate policies. Because if you don't, if you have the Medicare person listed first and they come off, it completely cancels that person's insurance, the secondary person, and it starts a brand new member number, deductible, everything starts brand new. And then it's a hassle, making sure the deductible max out of pocket from the old plan goes to the new plan. It's just the way the system is set up. And until they fix it, otherwise, there's no way to, there's no way to fix that. So if you have the option, it's they're walking into your door, they're brand new, list the whoever's going on Medicare second. If they're in your office, it's already too late. Pay attention to the birth dates for open enrollment. I'm always looking. I'm seeing who's 65. Oh, you're 64. Oh, you're going to Medicare. If they are listed first, I will swap them. It's a pain in the butt. You have to do it through the redirect or tell them I'm going to enroll you in two separate plans. That way, when I drop the Medicare person, the non-Medicare person's plan continues. Um, Jill, I said the 15th, just because the 15th is... The, the date that if something goes wrong, uh, it's the 15th, but you can do it earlier. It's just kind of around the time that we do it and on the 15th. It can be done earlier, but make sure you say they're losing coverage. Otherwise it can affect that and instantly change it. You don't want to change it. There are some carriers um, that are aware of this glitch and they know that if the person's 64 years old and suddenly on July 12th, it's canceled, which is a really odd date for just the one person. They will cover them, um, but carrier specific, ask your carrier. Three of the carriers in my state, they have told us we will, we will still cover them because we know that there's this weird glitch. All right, so Kara, premium, uh, your client paid her Blue Cross premium July 7th and it cleared yesterday. Her husband was primary, moved to Medicare July 1st. Could that have caused the delay. Uh, yes, and you should also, if they're set up for auto pay, that can cause a delay because the auto pay is going to the wrong one. It's going to the old policy that has been closed. Um, so if the 
Medicare person is listed first and you're taking them off, it's going to cause a, it's going to cause a problem. So just be aware of it and say, all right, this is what's happening. Don't turn off your auto pay because that's going to go to the wrong one. And then you're going to end up double paying. Um, if they write a check, that one, sometimes the carrier can take it. It may have the wrong uh, policy number and they can move it, but sometimes they don't. They get this check and they're like, oh, this policy's canceled. And they send the check back. In the meantime, the other one's not being paid and they're trying to get the prescriptions. <laughs> so yeah, it can cause um, delay on some of that. And that's probably a CARA. It depend, I don't know your, the you know, every Blue Cross in every state's different, but that would probably be my guess is that's what was happening is it was moving around. I, when you do that, often you will see that pay premium button come up because it's going to a new policy. So that's when I would say, let's make that premium payment now. Um, or if you want, you can wait find out what the new member number is going to be, and then call the carrier and get this switched around. When you say list, okay, let me read what you're saying, Gail. When you say listed first, do you mean the contact person? Because you can delete a person and they can still be the contact person. You can't delete a person. If a person is completely deleted, they're no longer on the application. It's just primary. So it, the, the contact person, I guess I never, it, I just the primary, the first person that you put in on as name of the application. That's who is, I guess it would be healthcare.gov's version of the contact person, but both whoever, whatever adults are on that policy or in that application is the contact. Just whoever's listed first is the name, everything's on um, the mailings and stuff. So just who, we, you're never going to delete a person unless it's a 26 year old that you suddenly found out, hey, they shouldn't have been on this application to begin with. You rarely are you deleting a person off the application. You're just saying somebody is or isn't getting coverage, especially at Medicare. So refund on premium payments. It will happen. Um, if somebody in October or November, right, they sign up for somebody in January with Blue Cross Blue Shield and they're like, I like it. And then they contact their doctor and their doc and they paid their premium. They were awesome. They paid their premium for January and November. And they found out, oh, my doctor just dropped that carrier. They're not going to work with them anymore. They're going to be with Aetna. I got to sign up for Aetna. Okay. We're going to, you know, they have until January 15th to switch. So you go in there and you switch the policy uh, to Aetna. But Blue Cross has already got their premium payment. They'll get it back, but it's going to take some time. And it's usually a whole lot longer than the client would like. So just let them know. Um, it takes if it's a good system, about two weeks. If you wait for the system to catch it, it can be even longer. So I always call the carrier or email the carrier contact um, and say, oh, okay, we need the premium. Because that just makes a person look at it as opposed to waiting for the system to run through everything and realize that they got the cancellation and all that kind of stuff. So people will get their premium payments back. Um, if they are changing or let's say they paid for January and then they got a job and their insurance started January 15th. So you go in there and you hit terminate January 15th, they will get a refund of the second half of their premium or whatever they weren't using. So there's no like, oops, I, you're sorry, <laughs> you lose your money. Um, if somebody pays a whole year in advance, which uh, you can do, like the carriers are happy to take the whole money all in advance. Um, and they, six months later, they get a job they get insurance somehow, they cancel it, they will get that premium back. But I always personally contact the carrier on behalf of my client. I tell them they can contact the carrier just so a person in the system looks at it and starts getting the, the re refund returned back faster. Any questions on eh, some of that? Jill, would it be easier to simply put them on different applications to begin with? You can't be on different applications. So remember, application is the entire household. You can put them on separate insurance policies, um, but you have to have them on the same application if they are a household income uh, or taxable household. You can't have an application for Bob and an application for Susie. The only exception is maybe if Susie's living in a different state um, because you can't have an application two people in different states, but you would still keep them on the same application. So remember, marketplace application is a tax document. It has absolutely nothing to do with insurance. The application is about your taxes. 
and how much tax credit you're going to get and how much are they going to pay every month based on your income. You have to do the application with everybody on it. Then at the end, now the application is done. Now it's submitting to the insurance company. Now, okay, which insurance company are we going through? Are we going to put them in separate plans? You certainly can do that. I like doing that. I do it all the time, especially if one, one spouse is doctors in a different, with a different carrier. Great. Put them in separate plans. Or one is really sick and one never goes to the doctor. Well, maybe the really sick one needs a gold plan, needs, needs the least max out of pocket. Well, the person who never goes to the doctor doesn't. So I put them in a bronze plan. So you can split them. At the end of the application, once everything, the tax application has been submitted, now you're in, talking insurance, you can put them in separate policies. And it is easier than trying to switch them if they're already listed that way. Um, the benefit of keeping them on the same um, insurance at the same insurance policy, if there's two people only, there is no benefit. If there's three people or more, the benefit is that the deductible is only times two and the max out of pocket is only times two. So if you have three people in a car accident, they're not paying 5,000 per person for a $10,000 deductible, they're paying 10,000 as a whole for all three of them. So if you have a family of three or more, there is an advantage to keep them together because of that deductible. But when it's a family of two, there is no reason you have to keep them on the same policy. There's no benefit. Now they may think it's a benefit because they just want to pay one carrier or they just want to have one premium payment. But as far as the policy itself, there's no benefit. Um, that's why you can split them and it's kind of nice. If you do split them though, um, in this open enrollment, right? I'm looking and I'm like, ah, great. <laughs> Bob and Susie, Bob is turning 65 on March. I will say, let's just put you in two separate policies. This way I can just cancel Bob's and Susie yours will continue. So you, you can do it then, but you kind of got to let them know because here's what's going to happen. They were on the same policy for 2023. 2024, I put them in two different policies. Any guesses on what's going to happen? One of them is going to get a new member number. They're going to have to make a new auto pay or set up a new payment. They're going to have to tell their doctors they have a new member number. Now, first world problems is kind of insignificant, but it's significant if they don't know. As long as you tell them this is what's going to happen, they're fine with it. Okay, yeah, no problem. All right, so let's set up an auto pay for Susie because it looks like you're the one. That's where the premium payment will show up. It looks like you're going to get a new member number. So let's pay that right now and get that set up. Bob, your auto pay is set up. It's fine. It'll automatically adjust to just you and, and adjust the premium payment accordingly. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't have a lot of faces. So um, can I enroll someone with an effective date in the middle of the month? No, unfortunately, there is none of that. And that glitch I tried to find. So I did try to see if I could find any glitches. Uh, there is no middle of the month. I'm hoping that will change in the future, but that would mean they probably would have to make the system smarter than it is. And the government hasn't updated the non-smart systems since it started. So as of right now, no mid-month. Um, and if you're interested in how to do that, I believe that was last week's uh, conversation. That is recorded. That is on the Zoom um, recordings from previous. Can you change a plan outside of OEP by claiming loss of coverage? Yep, been able to do that since it started. If you say they're losing coverage at the end, of, if they are currently on a marketplace, they have a plan, and you say they are losing coverage at the end of the month, it will say, hey, you have an open enrollment, and you can change plans. In the old days, it let you only change plans within the tier that they were in, bronze tier, the silver tier. You couldn't go from a silver to a bronze or bronze to a gold. It would only let you change within the same metal tier. I'm expecting when that is turned back on, <laughs> when the system is doing what it's supposed to do, that will come back. But as of right now, it lets you change. It never asks for any proof of co coverage ending. It never has. Um, in fact, that is the trick to do if you have somebody at the end of the year for open enrollment who you are not sure is going to stick with the plan that they have, or they're going to maybe they need some more time. Technically, everybody loses coverage December 31st. It's a new plan. Doesn't matter if it's the same carrier. Doesn't matter if the plan name is the same because the plans change every year. Their coverage ends December 31st and they get new coverage on the first of the month. And when you say I've lost coverage, you get 
two months to enroll. So then it would give them all the way out to change their plan in March if they needed to. This was a trick we used before December, uh, January 15th was an option um, just to get people in for January 1st or February uh, 1st if they needed to switch it. Um, is there only one scenario where you have to wait until the 31st to enroll or take someone off the plan? It's only that one. Other Because if it's a single person or you're terminating the whole family because they got a coverage at the job, you just go in there on Health Sherpa and hit terminate coverage. It'll ask what date. You pick the date and then it's just done. So it could be mid that you can always cancel mid month. Uh, you can do it ahead of time. Health Sherpa has changed their system, which is really nice. And it'll actually show you now that you've already hit the termination date. But glitches, I'll tell you what happens. So you go in there, you say, I want, you know, the whole family, Smith family is losing their coverage on the 31st. And then you come back to the main screen and it, it doesn't show it. It doesn't look like it. And you're like, did I do it? Cause you're like, ah, so you go in and you say terminate coverage on the 31st and it won't let you. It's a, it, it just won't let you. And now they did change the wording. Now, now it says you've already done this. Oh, okay. So um, if you're like, me and I'm like, I think I did. I'm not sure if I did. I better terminate again, just in case it will kind of let you know now, but if it just won't let you, it's because you did already do it or, you know, there's only 30 days in the month, but, um, you can enroll, uh, otherwise you can enroll on the 20th of the month for insurance. Yep. If you say they're losing coverage at the end of the month, it will start on the first. So, um, you, I, like I said, it's a habit. I don't even think about it anymore. I always say somebody's losing coverage at the end of the month, always. Whether they're a new person coming in, whether I'm updating the application, because it just makes the system work better. Um, I have had times where I was going there to update income or something that needed to be updated, but I didn't push that. And then the carrier never actually got the correct information. So this was my way of always making sure the carrier got the information submitted to them. And I've been doing it for eight years now. I'm pretty sure I learned that in the second year of the marketplace. So uh, always just put, sometimes I get questions from people and I'm like, why, why is that happening? Oh, that's right. Cause you didn't say they're losing coverage at the end of the month. Just, just do it if they're in the system and you're updating. And if you're brand new and you're putting them in that way, it's always starting on the first of the next month. The tax credit isn't affected at all. Remember, they're two separate things um, as far as like getting the tax credit. What it will do is it it separates it um, according to their age. If one person's older, they get the bigger tax credit than the other one. The quote tool does not show you what it looks like. So if you're trying to quote somebody and they need to be in separate policies, it, it unfortunately, it doesn't show you. So I just go, all right, the tax credit, and then I... Um, I'll probably do this more during open enrollment because we're over time, but it, it you kind of just guess. I go, okay, Bob, you're going to go on the gold plan. Let's cut that number in half. Susie, you're going on the bronze plan. That quote number, let's cut that in half. And then we go through the whole application. We go to pick those two separate plans and then you actually see what it is. And if one person isn't using all of their tax credit because the premium is already is low, let's say they're taking that bronze plan and it's going to cost them nothing the leftover tax credit will go towards the other person. So it doesn't affect the tax credit as far as like, they, they still get the same amount. It's just how it splits, but it's still accurate. The percentage is still correct. Um, the total cost between the two people is still what it should be, even if they were on the same plan together. So that's it for today. Um, I went over, there's so much information. Next week, we are going to talk about newborns, uh, how to handle that effectively, how to not run into some of the issues that happens if it's not done correctly. Um, I thank you guys very much for coming. Uh, recordings will be out there today. Uh, I'll get to it later tonight to get that out. And I just thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. If anybody, um, I've ran into two people at a conference I'm at right now that remember me and I know it's because I'm the only one with pink hair. So if you do see me, <laughs> if you're going to be at next week's conference, I'm really excited to see some of you there. Um, you know, make sure you come up and say hi to me. I, it's, it's always wonderful to get to meet people. Uh, again, thanks everybody. I'm going to stop recording now.